Hello and welcome back to the morgue. watching this over on YouTube, then you will automatically notice I got a sign. I got an LED sign. I don't know why. I felt like that was a must when it came to video podcasting, but I have it. And it just really makes me feel like the morgue is real. The morgue is happening. The morgue is a fucking podcast. I got it off of Etsy, so I'll link that information in the description if you guys are interested in getting your own LED sign, but I'm definitely obsessed with it, and I just feel like we elevated a little. The podcast has elevated. <laughs> also, a little bit of an update, I guess. We are very steadily growing over on TikTok. I'm almost at 3,000 followers, which I know in the grand scheme of TikTok is absolutely nothing. But that being said, you know, every day I go on there, I get a couple more followers. I've been trying to kind of steadily post over there different things, and I'm excited about it. <laughs> Honestly, I am very excited. It makes me feel like all the time and effort I'm putting into all of this is kind of starting to show a little bit. I did get a couple videos that got, you know, in the tens of thousands of views, so that's just really exciting. And this all takes so much effort, so much more effort than I ever anticipated. So I hit a achievement on my podcasting website that I kind of upload everything to so it gets shared, and I got 25 downloads. Like, people are listening, even if it's just a handful of y'all out there. Thank you, honestly, thank you so much. Anybody who's coming over from TikTok, thank you. It kind of just gives me a little hope, I guess. That being said, I wanted to kind of have a little side conversation before we get into today's case. I guess to kind of set the scene of what I want to accomplish with all of this, with the morgue. I know kind of all of this that I just talked about in the beginning really just makes it seem like I just want to blow up. Obviously, yes, it would be nice to get some people who are really interested and, and enjoy it. But my main goal with all of this is to really start talking about victims. If I can find names, information on them, or anything like that, I will always share it by name. I really do want to show that we're focusing on the victims here. You know, these people were just that, real life people with families, and they deserve that respect from all of us. They deserve to be remembered and to be talked about. Sometimes when it comes to true crime stuff, we're talking more as a warning, I guess, or, you know, our brains over in the true crime community kind of work a little different than most. We don't trust anybody, and... That's a good thing, but it's also hard sometimes. On the other side of that, you know, I will always share victims' information if I can find it. When it comes to families and stuff like that, if their personal information is not out there, I'm not going to share names. I will speak if the victims themselves had children, but unless I absolutely have to, or of course, if the victim is a child, I am not going to be sharing their names over here. I don't care if they're 80 years old at this point. Unless they themselves have reached out as adults and spoken on it, we don't need to bring them back to the worst part of their lives, especially being children, if that makes any sense. True crime is always going to be a hard thing to talk about, but over the years we are moving in a direction that more people are talking about it. And it's okay to talk about it all. As long as we are being the most respectful that we can be at all times. But please remember, just like I just said, these are people. And I feel like every once in a while we need to snap back to that reality. Also, that being said, 
I really want this podcast to be more eventually. I'm brand freaking new to all of this. I'm starting from the very bottom here with my iPhone and my mic and now my new LED sign. <laughs> but eventually, I would like this to blow up, of course. Mainly to talk about quote unquote smaller cases though. My biggest goal with all of this is to be able to monetize this platform, obviously, and be able to give money to cold case organizations and, and the people who are truly working to close cases or help families out after, things like that. The cases that are unsolved and don't have the funding to continue to investigate. Obviously, at this point, again, I'm a very long way away from that. But I think it's important to know that the morgue has goals. I have goals. So thank you for every single follow, subscribe, download, because one day I hope I will get there. There will be some notoriety. And like all the great true crime podcasts out there, it's important. And I truly do just want to give back when it comes to it. And honestly, if I ever get to meet the host of Morbid, I'll cry. <laughs> so anyways, thank you for listening to all of that. But like I've said on the very first episode, please send in your case recommendations. The email is always in the show notes. It's themorgpod at gmail.com. And send in any of your personal true crime stories or even paranormal stories so we can jump to two episodes a week. I want y'all involved in this too. So that was a lot bigger of an intro than I normally do. So let's get into our case for today, which is a very infamous case. You already knew that from the title. I know I literally just said I want to focus on smaller cases, but this was a request that was sent in. And I will, of course, sprinkle in some larger cases here and there. Hell, those are the cases that got us all involved in true crime or interested in true crime. Hopefully not involved. I take that statement back. Hopefully just interested. We don't want to be involved in true crime, please. Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker. A fucking doozy of a case. This was one of the cases that always hit a little closer to home because both of my parents grew up in this area in Southern California while he was terrorizing people. I remember my mom talking about them being so scared and making sure all the windows in the house were locked every single night, which we all know was not normal in the mid 80s, as normal it is, as it is now anyways. The fear this man caused millions of people was like no other. And this is going to be a pretty deep dive into everything that we know. So get comfortable. Let's talk about it. I am just gonna put a little snippet in right now. Some of these names are very hard to pronounce. So when I post the photos of them, I will put their name underneath. I'm going to try my absolute hardest. I have another computer right over here to be able to try and look up pronunciations, but some of them are very hard to say. So please, I am sorry if I do not want to offend anybody by trying to pronounce this, but how else am I going to talk about it? Okay. Ricardo Richard Levia Munoz Ramirez. Born February 29th, 1960 in El Paso, Texas. There were some reports saying that he was born February 19th and other ones saying February 29th. I don't know which one's true. I don't have his birth certificate, but there were more 29ths than 19ths. Richard was born to Julian and Mercedes Ramirez, and he was the youngest of five other children. His father, Julian, was a Mexican nationalist and actually a former Juarez police officer. He later in life became a laborer and worked on the Santa Fe Railway once they moved into the United States. Now, Julian was definitely not deemed father of the year, as most sources reported. He was said to be a very serious alcoholic and was prone to very serious fits of anger and more times than not led to the physical abuse of his wife and children. 
His mother, Mercedes, was a factory worker once the family had again immigrated to the United States. There is not a lot known about Mercedes besides that she worked in a boot factory and had five children. There were reports that she later stated that all five of the children, though, were born with birth defects, from respiratory issues to bone deformities. One source stating they thought the harsh chemical fumes in the factory had a play in all of this, but also the physical abuse that was happening in the home during the times that she was pregnant. All of these things may be playing a part in what was to come later in life. So, Richard. He was said to be a pretty quiet kid, but very happy and very loving in his early childhood. But by the age of 10, he had started to drink alcohol, smoke weed, and this of course was a way for him to escape his home life. I don't think anybody would blame him for wanting to try and get himself out of the home, even if it was just in a mind altering out. I'm a very serious believer and it is okay to feel bad for the child. He was a child in what seemed like a very hard living situation and it's okay to feel some sort of sadness for him at that time. Now we can all be very upset and angry and disgusted by the adult. So many people go through horrible traumatic childhoods and don't murder a bunch of people. So me saying that it is okay to feel bad for him as a child is not an excuse for him in the future. When Richard was around the age of 12, he really took an interest into his cousin Miguel Mike Ramirez, who first reading about, I thought was gonna be a little piece of good in this story. I'm biased, obviously, because my husband served 10 years in the army, and he's the best person I know. That was not the case. I don't know why I let myself get any type of hope when it came to this case, because we all know how this ends. Now, Mike was a highly decorated Green Beret, Special Forces, for whoever doesn't know what a Green Beret is, in the United States Army. He was a combat veteran from Vietnam, and most people would want to show their respect in hearing something like that. But Mike had actually already been a self-admitted serial killer and rapist while serving in the war. I get that he was in a war for the first part anyways, so obviously a lot of people died. A lot of people on both sides of this war died. The Vietnam War was one of the worst in history, in all honesty, for the United States and honestly when it just came to war crimes. But that being said, a lot of people dying doesn't make someone a serial killer. It doesn't make someone a serial killer for going to war. But the things that Mike did were unlike anything you would think a highly decorated war veteran would come back home and brag about. He really just boasted about all of the war crimes he committed, even showing Richard at 12 years old Polaroid photos of Vietnamese women who he had raped, murdered, and dismembered or decapitated. So clearly he was no war hero or someone for Richard to look up to in any way despite many reports of him being highly decorated. But of course, Richard did just that. He looked up to this man. Richard would later state that he was absolutely fascinated by all of this. He wasn't disgusted or scared by the photos. He liked it. Because of this, Mike would take Richard under his wing, so to say, and would show him some military skills, like how to kill with stealth, and especially how to stay hidden at night. You and I both know that shit would come full fucking circle. So Richard would learn some stuff from his cousin during the day and would go home, but really just didn't want to be around his dad. So whenever he would get the chance, Richard would sneak out at night and sleep elsewhere. The elsewhere though, wasn't really something normal. Like, I don't know, a friend's house. Actually, I can find no reports of friends whatsoever that Richard might have had at this time, but no, 
not at a friend's house. He would sleep in a local cemetery. I think that it's pretty clear to assume Richard was very interested and honestly comfortable with the thought of death. All of that being said, we're going to skip forward a little to May 4th, 1973. Richard was 13 years old and was at his cousin Mike's house. And Mike was married to a woman named Jessie. I guess while he was there, an argument ensued between Mike and Jessie. And the argument got very heated. And Richard witnessed Mike retrieve a handgun and shoot Jesse in the face right in front of him. But we aren't talking about a quote-unquote normal 13-year-old boy who I'd hope, in all honesty, would be absolutely traumatized by this. No child should ever have to witness something like that. Ever. But Richard being Richard... He was not traumatized in any sense of the word. Again, later stating that he was fascinated by this. Because I can't just skip right past that, Mike was charged with the murder of Jesse, but was found not guilty by reason of insanity due to him having been diagnosed with severe PTSD from his service in Vietnam. I really think at this time, no one really knew what Mike had done over there besides the people that he would tell when he would get home, because if they did, they just swept that shit right under the rug. Because, well, I mean, it is the U.S. military. (laughs) Mike ultimately was confined for three years in a Texas state mental hospital for the murder. Three years. He got three years for that. Moving on, before my head explodes. I mean, it will explode during this whole thing, but it just can't yet, okay? Okay. After witnessing the shooting, it was said that Richard became a recluse. He was said to become very sullen and very withdrawn from his family and peers. Again, I don't think Richard actually had friends, so they refer to other people in his life as peers a lot. Richard then moved in with his older sister, Ruth, and her husband, Roberto. Again, the little glimmer of hope you want to get right there. Roberto was explained to be an obsessive peeping Tom, who, of course, took his 13, 14-year-old brother-in-law on these nighttime outings with him. This went on for years. When Richard was 14, he was said to have been starting to use LSD regularly, and him and Roberto bonded even more over the drug use and alcohol and, of course, the prowling. Once Mike got out of the mental hospital in 1977, Richard was now 17, Mike would join the two guys in their spying escapades. It was also stated at this time that Richard began forming an interest in Satanism and the occult. I do have to say, though, as a little side note, this was prime time for what would be later called Satanic Panic. That the media and police always wanted to blame Satanism for the reason people were unhinged. Unhinged, of course, being a very loose term for what the world would come to know as the time of huge active serial killers just roaming the streets. The term serial killer had just been thought of not too long before this. I 100% recommend Mindhunter on Netflix if you're interested in learning how the FBI came to coin this term and really dive into the criminal psychology division that they have and just so much information and new ways to look at killers, murderers, serial killers that have come from this sense. Nature versus nurture. The age-old question. Okay, sorry. If I look a little different all of a sudden, I had to adjust my light because I was getting really washed out from the LED light. I'm still learning. I'm trying to figure this out. (laughs) Also, I do just need to stop really quick. All three of my children are home right now, so if you hear a little yelp here and there, I apologize. Anyways, back to it. So around this time after Richard hit puberty, things obviously started to take an even darker turn for him. Richard really began to have disturbing sexual fantasies with a lot of violence like forced bondage, mutilation, and rape. He took a job at a local Holiday Inn, and of course, that just opened him up to so many opportunities to stalk people. 
which eventually led to Richard letting himself into guest rooms with his employee pass key. And he started out stealing things like valuables left in the room. It was reported a couple places that Richard on one occasion had molested two children in an elevator at the hotel, but it was never reported to police, so Richard was never prosecuted, and we honestly have no evidence of this happening. I'm not saying that it didn't, obviously, from what we come to learn, just food for thought. Now, that being said, Richard did end up getting fired pretty soon after this alleged assault on these two children, after he attempted to rape a woman in her hotel room. He was caught in the act by the victim's husband, and the husband, rightly so, beat his ass, and then called police to report it. Richard was arrested and charged, but of course, the charges were dropped. And you know what, maybe I shouldn't say it like that, but the charges did end up getting dropped. The victim and her husband actually refused to come back to Texas to testify against Richard because they lived out of state. I know so many will feel like maybe if this had happened and Richard had been prosecuted, this could have stopped long before the events to follow. But remember, it is so easy for you to say or me to say what you do in that situation, having never been in that exact same situation. At that time in life, the victim had every right to do what she wanted at that time, and we have to respect that. I could not find any victim information because of this, and we'll keep it at that. After his arrest and whatnot, it's kind of unknown what he was up to. I'm sure more of the same shit, but no reports of anything. Richard Pock backed up when he was 22 years old in 1982, where he kind of just decided to up and move to California from what it seemed like. He would kind of flop back and forth between San Francisco and Los Angeles County, and once there, he found his new drug of choice, cocaine. I think that was everyone's drug of choice in the 1980s, to be honest, but Richard loved it, which, in all honesty, cocaine in the 80s was not cheap. It was highly sought after, so it came at a high price tag. So what would any reasonable person do? Get a job, right? Yeah, okay. Well, we know Richard is the farthest thing from a reasonable person. So he then began to commit theft after theft and burglary after burglary. He needed to find a way to feed his addiction, which he needed money, and... That was his solution to that. He was just going to steal shit. He did get caught a couple times here and there, but or theft charges, you know, or burglary. It's burglary could be a felony, but sometimes it's not even a felony. So that brings us right up to the year long crime spree that would end up to deem Richard Ramirez the night stalker. I'm going to try and cover the victims, the crime and anything we found out later as quick as I can, but bear with me. There was a lot in this crime spree, and it's hard to find a lot of information on certain victims. Also, again, please excuse if I botch some of the names. <laughs> I'm trying, I promise. So, huge trigger warning. I don't normally give trigger warnings because this is a true crime podcast. People die, okay? I am going to give a trigger warning when it comes to this because we all know how horrific this was. But I do want to give you the opportunity to back out now. We are going to be covering some gruesome murders and rapes of all ages. Yes, that means even children. I know that word alone is hard for some people to hear, so that is why I want to give this right now. If you cannot listen to that right now, I completely understand. Go listen to one of the prior two episodes or just wait till the next one. I told you we were going to kind of deep dive, and that's what this is. I'm going to give you a lot of information about what happened to these victims. But this was even very hard for me to research. I was going to record this yesterday after researching it all, and it took me a while to finish writing all of this out. I could not last night. I did not want to record about it last night. 
I needed to get Richard Ramirez out of my fucking head. That being said, it was hard for me to research, and I don't want anyone to not know who this was and have a very hard time listening to it, not knowing. If you don't know who Richard Ramirez is, I'm going to tell you, but it is very hard to listen to. Thank you for listening. If this is where you're going to back out, if not, let's go. April 10th, 1984, nine-year-old Mei Lung lived in an apartment building with her family in the Tenderloin District of San Francisco. May was said to have been roaming the building with her eight-year-old brother looking for a dollar bill that they had lost. Richard saw the children and asked what they were doing. When May said that they were searching for a dollar bill, Richard took this as an opportunity to act like he wanted to help. He told May to follow him into the basement of the building so that they could look together. Of course, being nine, it's easy to think she thought nothing of this adult offering to help her. May followed Richard into the basement, and Richard attacked. May was found hanging from a pipe by her shirt, partially nude, and it was very clear that she had been beaten. Later, police would find out that she was also strangled and sexually assaulted. Her cause of death, though, was multiple stab wounds from a switchblade knife. The killing was not linked to Richard until 2009. Police finally retested some DNA they had from the crime scene and it matched to Richard. He was already awaiting execution at this point, so May's death was not added to his sentence or tried against him, but they were able to link it. Also, in 2016, police disclosed that they also have found evidence of a second suspect in May's murder, but nothing more has been reported on that. So, starting out with May is hard. She was a Chinese-American little girl, and unfortunately, there's no information about her. She wasn't found to be linked to Richard until 2009, so there's no reports that have surfaced from the day back in 1984. That is why it is so important to talk about lesser-known cases. We need to get their names out there. We know nothing about this child because no one cared to report about it at that time. But we're going to say her name today. That takes us to Jenny Vincow. She was alone in her apartment the night of June 27, 1985, in Glassell Park, Los Angeles. And just like any other night, she headed to bed not having any idea what was to come. It was reported that this was when Richard first started what would later be considered his almost systematic murders. Everything going to plan. Richard reportedly broke into Jenny's apartment and had begun to go through her belongings looking for valuables to feed the cocaine addiction, but couldn't find any. It was speculated that Richard got mad over this, but I truly believed he knew the real reason why he was in there. She was alone. I'm sure he did also want to rob her, but you can't tell me after all those years of being a peeping Tom with his brother-in-law, he hadn't scoped her out beforehand. Richard stabbed Jenny repeatedly in the head, neck, and chest while she was asleep in bed. Jenny's throat was slit so deep, police said that she had almost been decapitated. And there was evidence to show that she had been sexually assaulted after death. The next day, on June 28th, Jenny's son came to see her. He actually lived in the same apartment building and walked over letting himself in when she didn't answer the door. He stated that he immediately noticed that the apartment looked like it was turned upside down, Jenny's belongings thrown everywhere, and he ran to her room, finding his mother on the bed, gruesomely murdered. Up until 2009, Jenny was always considered Richard's first victim, and she is still very commonly reported as that. We obviously know now that that's not true. That being said, Jenny's son did end up testifying and was actually the very first witness that was called to the stand. No one could ever imagine 
finding your mother like that. But thankfully, he was strong enough to testify for her. The next couple victims are going to go pretty quick, so stay with me. It is a very tight timeline. March 17, 1985, Richard was out prowling and trying to find a home to enter near the city of Rosemead. That was when he noticed a car pulling into a garage near where he was hiding. Richard got into the garage and startled 22-year-old Maria Hernandez as she was getting out of her car. Richard shot her in the face almost immediately with a 22 caliber gun and then entered the home. Maria had a roommate that was home at the time, Dale Okazaki, and she heard the gunshot from outside and immediately ducked for cover. After a few moments, Dale saw Richard enter the kitchen and she attempted to pop her head over the counter after a few moments to see what he was doing. Unfortunately, Richard saw her and shot her right in the forehead, killing her instantly. Unbelievably, though, Maria was still alive. When she first saw Richard, he had hit his hands on her car and she turned around quickly and saw the gun. Out of pure, indescribable luck, she lifted her hands to cover her face when Richard lifted the gun and the bullet hit her car keys that were in her hand, in front of her face. Maria played dead, and Richard just pushed her aside as he went to go enter the home. Later, Maria testified that she played dead on the garage floor and heard the second gunshot. She thought the unknown man at the time would come back out the way that he came, through the garage door. So she got up and began to run towards the front door. Once she was about to enter, Richard opened the front door, and she crouched down and begged him not to shoot her again. And he didn't. He just left. Maria went inside to find her roommate, Dale, and called the police. Maria was able to later identify Richard in the courtroom as he sat 30-some-odd feet away from her. Now... While police were at the residence of Maria and Dale, Richard decided that he was not done for the night. Within an hour, Richard found another unsuspecting victim, Sai Yai Yu. He was 30 years old and was believed to be driving home and had stopped in the Monterey Park area. Richard was said to have ran up to her car and pulled Miss Yu out of the vehicle and shot her twice with the same 22 caliber gun then immediately fled on foot. Unfortunately, it took some time for someone to find her and be able to call police, and she was reported deceased at the hospital. Sai was born in Taiwan and was later buried there in Taipei City. At this point in the murders, none of these were linked, but it was reported that based on the fact police just had two murders and one attempted murder in the same night, with all in an hour of each other, these three murders were possibly committed by the same man. And police had Maria. She saw this unknown man. Maria described him as having curly hair with bulging eyes and wide-spaced, rotten teeth. Also because of the three attacks, that was when the media kind of went into a frenzy calling the attacker the walk-in killer or the valley intruder. Ten days later, yes, just ten days, Richard had found his next victim's home, just outside of Whittier, California, the home of Vincent Zazara, who was 64, and his wife Maxine Zazara, who was 44. Richard entered the home, believed to be through a window. He went straight into the couple's bedroom and found them asleep in bed. Richard went right up to Vincent and shot him in the head. The noise, obviously, waking up Maxine right next to him, and she started to scream, trying to figure out what was going on. Richard then decided to tie up Maxine and bound her to the bed, then asking her over and over again where the valuables were. Maxine began to tell Richard different places he could look, and during this time that he was looking, she was able to untie herself. Maxine knew that they had a shotgun underneath the bed, and 
This was her chance. She grabbed the gun, and right when she pulled the trigger, Richard turned around and click. The shotgun was not loaded. Richard was pissed and shot her three times, but that wasn't enough for him. He decided to head to the kitchen and grab a carving knife. He mutilated her, carving an upside-down cross in her chest and removing her eyes, then placing them in a jewelry box. It was also reported that he did try and sexually assault her afterwards, but I'm assuming told police that he just got too scared by her almost shooting him, and he couldn't get it up. Richard did then grab the jewelry box and brought it back to his apartment as a souvenir. The bodies were discovered by their son pretty soon after, and once police came out, they were able to find shoe prints in the flower beds, later linked to a pair of Avia sneakers. They photographed and casted the prints, and then there were also bullets and casings found at the scene which were an exact match to the prior murders. The 22 caliber bullets used 10 days prior. It was at this point police knew that they were dealing with a serial killer. And I'm sure with the media coverage once this was out, Richard knew that they were looking for one man. It seems as if he took a little bit of a short break, I guess if you could call it, and that was until May 14th, 1985. Richard has returned to Monterey Park, the same area that he killed Miss Yu, and had entered the home of 66-year-old Bill Doy and his disabled wife, 56-year-old Lillian Doy. Because of Lillian's disabilities, the couple didn't actually sleep in the same room. Richard entered Bill's room, and Bill woke up, immediately reaching for his own handgun, but Richard shot him before he could actually get to it. Richard then beat Bill until he went unconscious. Richard then went to Lillian's room, bound her with thumb cuffs. I didn't know what thumb cuffs were, so if you're like me, I've just entered a picture here. And Richard ended up raping Lillian and, of course, then ransacked the home looking for anything of value. Bill did end up dying as a result of his injuries, but later in the hospital. Lillian, thankfully, did survive the attack and was able to tell police that he was a tall Hispanic man with bad teeth. Police at this point did make a composite sketch of the suspect, which was blasted all over. They also tried to trace back the Avia sneaker, and to their surprise, that specific shoe had only been sold in America since earlier that year. Detectives ran a check in and found that only one shoe was that brand and size had been sold in the Los Angeles area, but they were unfortunately paid for with cash, and the store clerk couldn't remember who actually had bought them which ultimately led to another dead end. Two weeks after the attack at the Doys on May 29th, Richard drove a stolen car to Monrovia and found the house of Mabel Ma Bell at age 83 and her sister Florence Nettie Lang, age 81. Nettie was also disabled, so Mabel was caring for her at this time. Richard entered the home and found a hammer in the kitchen. He had then bound and bludgeoned the sisters in their respective bedrooms and found an electrical cord and started to shock the sisters. Richard also raped Nettie and then used Mabel's lipstick he had found and drew a pentagram on her legs. Richard also drew pentagrams on both of the women's bedroom walls and they were found two days later and were rushed to the hospital and placed in comas. Mabel, unfortunately, did end up dying from her injuries. There was not much more information on the women that I could find besides that. Nettie did survive the attack. The next day, in the same stolen vehicle, Richard entered the home of Carol Kyle who was a 42-year-old mother and lived in Burbank, California. Holding Carol at gunpoint, 
he bound Carol and her 11-year-old son and began ransacking the home. After some time, he untied Carol and told her to show him where all the valuables were, then locked her son in a closet and repeatedly raped her, telling her not to look at him or he'd rip her eyes out, which obviously knowing the previous murders is terrifying. Once he was done, he let the son out of the closet, bound Carol and her son again with handcuffs, and left. He never stated why he didn't kill them, and obviously I'm not complaining, but it definitely makes you wonder. A lot of people try and speculate that it was because the son was there and he obviously knew what he was doing was wrong, but people try and say it kind of shows some compassion that he hid the son away so he didn't see what he was doing. That's not compassion to me, in all honesty, but okay. So now we know that he already had killed a child before that. So what was different about this one? And in all honesty, he had just left two more witnesses. Just like that. Unfortunately, now the victim's information starts to get even less. But I, again, tried to find everything. It's hard because this is such an infamous case because of Richard Ramirez people stop reporting about the families, the victims, and everything else. They're just focused on telling us this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened, and then he was caught. Anyways, on the night of July 2nd, it seemed to be a random selection of a home in Arcadia, the home of 75-year-old widowed grandmother Mary Cannon. He quietly entered Mary's home while she slept and had grabbed a lamp that was next to her and began to hit her repeatedly with it. Richard then grabbed a 10-inch butcher knife and began stabbing her over and over, even after she was clearly not alive anymore. He then left. Mary was found a couple of days later. Three days after that, July 5th, 1985, Richard broke into a home in Sierra Madre finding 16-year-old Whitney Bennett asleep, of course. Richard bludgeoned her with a tire iron. He then attempted to find a knife, but failed, thankfully, and grabbed an electrical cord and attempted to strangle Whitney with it. Richard later stated that while he was doing this, the cord began to spark and he stopped and fled stating he believed that Jesus Christ had intervened to save her. Either way, Whitney did survive that brutal attack, needing 478 stitches to close the laceration on her scalp. Whitney did later testify against Richard at trial, also being able to point him out in the courtroom. I can't even imagine how scary that would be, but also how amazing that would feel after this. I cannot imagine. Two days later, Richard was back in Monterey Park again, where he burglarized the home of Joyce Nelson, who was 60 years old and asleep on her couch. Richard pulled Joyce off of the couch and began stomping on her face. Horrifically, police later were able to find an avia sneaker shoe print that was left imprinted on her face. I mean, I guess it is still obviously evidence and it goes to show that he didn't change his shoes, but he then left the home and chose another home, the home of 63-year-old Sophie Dickman. Richard handcuffed Sophie and held her at gunpoint while he attempted to rape her. He also then stole her jewelry, and when Sophie swore to him that he had gotten all of the valuables, I guess Richard didn't like who she had swore to, looking at Sophie and stating that she needed to swear to Satan that she had given him everything. Sophie's neighbor at the time was actually a deputy, Linda Martinez, and she stated that she could hear Sophie crying for help but Richard was long gone before she went over there. 
On July 20th, Richard purchased a machete before driving a stolen Toyota to Glendale, finding his next home of Leela Needing, 66 years old, and her husband Mason, 68 years old. I'm sure you can guess what Richard did. The couple was horribly mutilated with the machete and then both shot with the 22 caliber handgun. He robbed the house and then quickly sold the stolen goods that he had gotten and made his way out to Sun Valley. Around 4.15 a.m., he broke into the home of the Kavanaugh family, which consisted of Chainarong, the husband, Somkid, the wife, and their eight-year-old son. Richard immediately shot Chainarong with a 25 caliber gun. It is unknown when he got the second gun, but believed that he might have known that the police knew the kind of gun at this point, so he switched. Richard then bound the son and began to rape and beat some kid, forcing her around the house to show him where there was any money or valuable items, of course. Telling her again she needed to swear to Satan that she wasn't hiding any money from him. He then ended up sexually assaulting the son as well before leaving. Somkin and her son both survived the attack and was again able to give a detailed description of the suspect to police. At this point, this is when the media dubbed him the Night Stalker. Less than a month later, Richard drove to Northridge and entered the home of Chris and Virginia Peterson. He caught 27-year-old Virginia off guard, startling her, and shot her in the face. Chris was trying to figure out what was going on, and then Richard shot him in the temple and attempted to flee when he realized that Chris wasn't going down. Chris fought Richard tooth and nail and was able to not be hit by two more shots that Richard had tried to shoot him. They struggled for a time, and Richard was ultimately able to escape. Both Chris and Virginia survived and reported it all to the police. Two days later, August 8th, Richard was in Diamond Bar, California and picked the home of Sakina, 28, and Elias Abwa, 31. Around 2.30 a.m., he entered the home and honestly did the exact same thing. Shot Elias while he was sleeping and then tied up and raped Sakina while asking for valuables. I do really think that why 90% of the time the men didn't make out of it was more of Richard saw them as a threat. If there was a man in the house, Richard normally shot them first because, well, I mean, Chris Peterson. He was going to fight and did. Anyways, during the attack at the Abawath's house, the couple's three-year-old son entered the room and Richard then tied him up and continued to assault Sakina. Once he finally left, Sakina was so weak from everything, but was able to untie her son and told him to go to the neighbor's house and get help, which he did just that. At three years old, guys, absolutely heartbreaking. This whole fucked up case is heartbreaking, but my God, you just don't think it can get any worse. By this point, Richard knew the police were kind of getting close. The media are really just telling a lot of information. He was able to keep up with the investigation, which is why now it is so hard to find any information in regards to active cases. Richard decided he needed to get the hell out of Dodge and headed back up to San Francisco area. Within 10 days of the previous attack and murder, on August 18, 1985, Peter and Barbara Pan were found dead in their home. Peter, 66 years old, was found with a gunshot wound from a 25 caliber handgun in his temple. And Barbara, 62, was also shot in the head. She was also said to have been beaten horrifically and sexually assaulted. A pentagram and the phrase, Jack the Knife was written on the bedroom wall of the couple. But again, an avia shoe print was found at the scene. By this point, this is national news, but huge in California. So 
police in San Francisco knew of the crimes that had been happening in Los Angeles, and they reached out to LAPD and were able to show the ballistics lined up and the shoe print. They knew that they had the same guy that was terrorizing Los Angeles now up in San Francisco. The police in San Francisco decided to hold a press conference and literally stood there on TV and stated the shoe evidence that it was an Avia sneaker. The gun was a 25 caliber handgun. And let me just say that pissed off LAPD. I mean, up until this point, obviously a lot of information was on the news, but LA didn't just give out crucial information like that. I mean, now anybody, because we know people are fucked up, could just come and say that they did it because they know these pieces of evidence and what they were most worried about happened. Richard indeed saw this and we'd later find out after seeing this blasted on the news, Richard took his Avia sneakers and dropped them right over the Golden Gate Bridge on his way back to LA. On August 24th, Richard drove 76 miles south of LA to Mission Viejo, and of course he was on the prowl when he landed on the home of James Romero. The Romeros had just returned home from Rosarito, Mexico, where they enjoyed a nice family vacation. I don't know why this made my stomach hurt when I first read it, because my family used to go to Rosarito constantly, all the time. And you know, it's just those little tidbits of a case that makes it hit home. Anyways, sorry. Richard thought that everyone in the house was asleep, but quickly realized he was mistaken. When James, 13-year-old son, walked outside to get a pillow from the truck he had left from the trip back home. The son heard a noise from a bush outside, but figured it was an animal or something and investigated a little, but didn't find anything. His son then made his way to the garage. The 13-year-old was fixing up a mini bike when he heard Richard's footsteps. He ran inside to wake his parents and while he was doing so, saw Richard's face through the window. At that point, Richard knew it was too late and started to flee, but the 13-year-old was not about to let him go scot-free. He ran outside just in time to see an orange Toyota sedan and even got a partial license plate. The father, following quickly behind, then contacted police and told them he believed his son had just chased away who they thought at the time was just a thief or someone who was going to try and break into the home. But little did he freaking know it was the Night Stalker. I'm sure you're not surprised at this point, but that, of course, did not stop Richard. He had been going at this for a year almost at this point. Not too long after, Richard got into the house of 30-year-old Bill Carnes and his fiance, 29-year-old Inez Erickson, believed at this time through a back door. Bill was awoken to the sound of Richard cocking his gun, and he shot him three times in the head. Then Richard turned his attention to Inez. He bound her with neckties he found in the closet, telling her that he was the Night Stalker, and forced her to swear that she loved Satan while he beat her with his fists. He demanded cash and jewelry, and then sexually assaulted her in another room. And before leaving the home, he looked at her and said, tell them the Night Stalker was here. Inez was able to untie herself and ran to a neighbor's house for help, which they called the police, and amazingly, Bill was still alive and underwent surgery. They were able to remove two of the three bullets, and Bill survived along with his fiance. Inez was able to, yet again, give another detailed description. And because of this, police had a car and pretty solid suspect sketch, if I'm being honest. They were able to find an abandoned, stolen Toyota four days later in Koreatown, which matched the description of the Ramiro kid 
telling them. Police knew this was it. They knew this was the car. And they fingerprinted the shit out of it. No matter how hard he tried, police found one singular fingerprint that they were able to lift. Richard had wiped 99% of the car clean, but they found one. Thanks to his pretty long rap sheet of petty crimes up until this point, that was it. Richard Ramirez was identified after a year-long terror spree. Police even stating the identification of that fingerprint was a near miracle. As that identification system was brand new. They had just gotten it. And the system only held criminals born after January 1st, 1960. Richard was born February 1960, if you forgot. They had a one-month gap, y'all. I don't think you understand how insane that is. (laughs) We all need to take a moment. August 29th, 1985, law enforcement released a mugshot of Richard from 1984, where he had been arrested for stealing a car. And just like that, the Night Stalker had a face. Police stating, we know who you are now. And soon, everyone else will. There will be no place you can hide. And they were right about that. (laughs) The next day, Richard got into a bus to Tucson, Arizona to visit his brother. Completely unaware at this point, his photo had been broadcasted all over California. But when he got there, his brother wasn't home. So he hopped right back on the next bus and got back to LA the morning of August 31st. He actually walked right past a couple officers that were waiting at the bus station in hopes to find him. And he walked into a convenience store in East LA. That was when a group of elderly Hispanic women looked at him and called him El Matador, literally the killer in Spanish. He saw his face on every front page newspaper and panicked. He began to try and run, actually run, and ended up running across the I-5 freeway. If you've never been to California, you don't understand how big the I-5 is. This is not just a couple lane freeway. He ran across a, I believe, six lane freeway for each side. And while doing so, he attempted to carjack an unlocked Ford Mustang, but failed, then ran and attempted to take the car keys from Angelina Torre. Please excuse my horrible Spanish accent. (laughs) That is just how you pronounce it. But Angelina's husband was not about to let that happen and began to chase him down. And that's when he realized who it was, shouting to anybody that would listen. Manuel Torre struck Richard over the head with a fence post and a group of residents began to help him. They beat the shit out of Richard, y'all. I mean, beat the shit out of him. (laughs) They held him down in the street until someone finally called in to police about a disturbance. Not that they had found the Night Stalker. Basically, they called in a fight in progress that was going on in the middle of a street. Police finally arrived around 8 a.m. and quickly realized who this was. Beaten and unarmed Richard Ramirez. The crowd quickly grew to a couple hundred people and they were angry. Police were able to transport him, though, back to Hollenbeck Police Station. So, Richard's caught. And I'm sure it was a huge sigh of relief to not only the victims, but California as a whole. Jury selections finally began around July of 1988. At Richard's first court appearance, he had drawn a pentagram on his hand and yelled, Hell Satan, in the courtroom. This photo is probably one of the most infamous of all of them when it comes to Richard Ramirez. And I know I said earlier this was kind of satanic panic, And I just really can't tell if Richard just fed into all of that. Like, he wanted to scare people, obviously, who was caught at this point. And, I mean, he tried to incorporate it into the murders. But 
I don't know if he was just feeding into it or maybe he really was into Satanism. Obviously, I don't know him, thankfully, but just my thought on things. During trial prep, an inmate that was housed in the same jail as Richard stated he heard Richard planning to shoot the prosecutor. Because of this, metal detectors were installed outside the courthouse, which nowadays is like that's just crazy because they are in every single courthouse in the nation and I really wonder if this is where it started like if this is when they decided we need metal detectors then on August 14th 1988 the trial was interrupted due to a juror not showing up Phyllis Singletary was found later that day dead in her apartment Phyllis was shot to death and Let me tell you, this freaked people out. The jurors were terrified, thinking somehow Richard was involved in her murder. It was ultimately determined, however, that she was killed by her boyfriend, who had later that same day shot and killed himself in a hotel room. But the juror who replaced Phyllis was terrified to return to her home. And, I mean, I don't blame her, shit. Like, that's terrifying, and you'd... Even finding it out afterwards, I'm sure it still put doubt into people's heads. But, thankfully, September 20th, 1989, Richard was convicted of all 43 charges. 13 counts of murder, 5 counts attempted murder, 11 counts of sexual assault, and 14 burglaries. He was sentenced to death by gas chamber on November 7th, 1989. We obviously don't do gas chambers anymore, but it kind of snaps you back to when this was really going on. But after sentencing, Richard told reporters, big deal. Death has always went with the territory. See you in Disneyland. The fuck it does that mean? I don't know, but (laughs) okay, I guess. Trial cost $1.8 $1.8 million and was the most expensive murder trial in California history up until it was later surpassed by the O.J. Simpson trial in 1994. During this time, a psychiatrist had stated that Richard was a made psychopath rather than born this way. Callback, nature versus nurture. He stated that Richard schizoid personality disorder contributed to his lack of feelings towards his victims and and honestly his lack of ability to be treated basically it was why he showed no remorse also stating that Richard had been knocked unconscious and almost died multiple times before the age of six and this had led to brain damage like temporal lobe epilepsy and being aggressive, and hypersexuality. So there we are, like I just said, nature versus nurture. Was this all brain damage, or was he just pure evil and was born pure evil? I'll let you guys make your own conclusions on that, because God knows I have, when it comes to this case anyways. Richard Ramirez died in Marion General Hospital in California, June 7, 2013. That's only 10 years ago, y'all. That's 10 years ago. That's crazy. He lived a long fucking time. He ended up dying of lymphoma and did not make it to his execution. So, that was the horrible, fucked up, gut-wrenching case of the Night Stalker. But, honestly, he's infamous enough. I'm going to read the victim's name one more time because that's what we should all care about. Not the monster the victims. May Young, nine years old. Jenny Vincow, 79 years old. Maria Hernandez survived her attack at 22 years old. Dale Okazaki, 34 years old. Sai Young Yu, 30 years old. Vincent Zazara, 64 years old. Maxine Zazara, 44 years old, Bill Doy, 66 years old, Lillian Doy, survived her attack at 56 years old, Mabel Ma Bell, 83 years old, Florence Nettie Lang, 
survived her attack at 81 years old. Carol Kyle and her son survived their attack at 42 years old and 8 years old. Mary Cannon, 75 years old. Whitney Bennett survived her attack at 16 years old. Joyce Nelson, 60 years old. Sophie Dickman, 63 years old. Leela Needing, 66 years old. Mason Needing, 68 years old. Chainarong Kavanoff, 32 years old. Somkid Kavanoff, I could not find her age, survived her attack. Some kid's eight-year-old son also survived his attack. Chris Peterson survived his attack at 42 years old. Virginia Peterson survived her attack at 27 years old. Sakina Abawath survived her attack at 27 years old. Elias Abawath, 31 years old. The Abawath's three-year-old child also survived. Peter Pan, 66 years old. Barbara Pan survived her attack at 62 years old. The Romero family survived their almost attack, but in my brain, I still consider them victims or almost victims. Bill Carnes survived his attack at 30 years old. Inez Erickson survived her attack at 29 years old. Again, the victims deserve more recognition than he does. And if you're still listening to this, thank you. This is a horrible case, and it's definitely very hard to hear. Even though it is so well known, until you sit down and look at it all, you don't know everything that went on. And... The lives that were terrorized and the lives that were lost at the hands of this man. The world is a million times better off without his nasty ass presence here anymore, even in jail. The earth is one scumbag cleaner. Thank you so much for listening. Like, subscribe, comment, download, do whatever it is you need to do on wherever you're listening at. I need a drink after that. Thank you for coming to the morgue. Bye.